again tonight, uh, please, and I want to try to get up to Imputioli, if we can, with the Apostle Paul in the 28th chapter of the book of Acts. Now keep in mind that he was shipwrecked on the island of Malta, and we've been there. I want to please get back in the business of verse number uh, 5. He shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. The fickleness of the world never ceases to amaze me. Really, the only thing you can put your confidence in is in the eternal verity of the Word of God. It's the only thing you can have confidence in. I mean, you can even read the history books, and I read a lot of history, uh, a bunch out of the ancient historians, Flavius Josephi, Josephus, uh, Pliny, Pliny the Younger, uh, Tacitus, so on and so forth, uh, Plato, Socrates, all those different guys. And it's amazing to me how they have different slants on even history. I don't know whether you guys have studied history very much or not, but there's a lot of different slants. You kind of have to read a, a composite of several different authors to get kind of an idea of what is going on uh, here and there. But boy, you can trust the Word of God. It's the only thing you can put your confidence in, but you can trust the Word of God. Man is fickle, and he'll see things in his own view. It's got to be inspired of God if it's going to be eternal and if it's going to be verifiable. That's why I love the Bible. Well, these guys changed their mind about Paul. They said one way he was a murderer that vengeance has gotten to and the next minute they were saying, no, he's a God. Well, he was neither one. He was just the bond slave of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And uh, this is seen by verses 7 and following in the same quarters now that's where they were in Malta probably in what's called in our day St. Paul's Bay on the island of Malta uh, in the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island he was probably the governor of the island whose name was Publius who received us and lodged us three days courteously and I think that when he says lodged us, that Luke is talking about Paul and, and probably the, uh, I don't know, the captain of the ship and the centurion who was with Paul there. Uh, and I think that the centurion would probably have been counted as one of the chief men. Paul, Dr. Luke, and Aristarchus and the company uh, that was with Paul, he received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux. Uh, he was in bad shape. To whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. Now do you get the picture? Uh, here is the Apostle Paul. He was in that special time zone, that transitional time zone, uh, while the New Testament canon was yet incomplete. Now we go by the canon of Scripture. But back then, God authenticated the message many times by the performing of miracles of the apostles. Remember, as I've stated so many times before, God went about confirming them with signs and miracles and uh, working wonders. Now here, the Apostle Paul, having come upon the island of Malta because of the shipwreck, uh, goes in and prays uh, for Publius, the governor's dad, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. Now I can't do that, folks. Uh, but I believe that God gave those fellows back then the power to do that. Do I still believe that God heals today? Yes, I believe that God still heals today. But I don't think that he does it in the same manner as he did it back then. Back then I believe that God really gave his men who were being used to write the New Testament 
uh, the strength, the power to do that as they called upon God. You'll always find that. I believe that God gave them the power to do that. But today, I believe that the minister can pray for people. I believe that we all are a kingdom of kings and priests and God and our Father, and that we all should pray one for another. And I want to tell you something. I do believe that God does work in this day that we live in uh, under different circumstances uh, but I do believe that he works and so help me I myself have gone into hospital rooms before and even silently uh, prayed I can tell you of different instances uh, while people were talking around me in, in dire circumstances uh, where the people calmed down uh, while I was praying silently I don't even think other people in the room knew that I was praying silently uh, but I have seen and I especially remember that one little boy who had been run over by the bicycle and he, or uh, not by the bicycle he was on a bicycle when he was hit by a car he was uh, run over and I remember going in that room with Marcia and it was such a terrible situation there but I believe that that was one instance where God took over and I believe that God helped that young young man uh, get over that situation and of course he did live and uh, is grown today. I hope you'll consider him in your prayers that he might start walking with the Lord and be thankful unto God for what God did for him. Now here we have the Apostle Paul going in and praying for Publius father and healed him. Now, it's interesting that so when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed. Uh, so it's an interesting situation in a way that the snake bite which Paul received and was not hurt by it turned around to be kind of an authenticating factor for the Apostle Paul's work that he had to do. Now, in these verses, you're not going to read any statistics of how many got saved or how many were baptized or how many came to the services. In fact, you'll not even read where the Apostle Paul gave testimony of the Word of God. I want to say this, it seems to me that the Apostle Paul, without condition, without reservation, did what he could to help those people on that island. I say that, but I want to hurriedly follow it with this. What the devil meant for bad, God took it and used it for good. Now you can cite Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 21 in regards to Joseph for that very thought and you can cite the book of Philippians chapter number 1 and verses 12 through 21 for that same thing and the same concept. I'd like you to turn to Philippians chapter number 1 and I want to begin reading in verse number 12 please. And the reason I say this is because that Philippians was written from Rome. It is considered one of the prison epistles. It is thought that perhaps Philippians was written after Paul was released and re-arrested after the burning of Rome in uh, 67 AD, I believe it was, by Nero Caesar. Now, here in the book of Philippians, I want us to notice, please, beginning in verse number 12. But I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Now, what's he talking about when he says the things which happened unto him? 
brothers and sisters, he's talking about the problems of his being arrested. He's talking about the problems of his shipwreck. He's talking about the problems of his bonds, his chains. He's talking about his being under house arrest. And he says, I want you to understand that these things which look bad that have happened unto me, God has turned them around and used them. How? Well, let's read a little bit further. For the furtherance of the gospel. Verse 13. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. Man, the very palace itself. And many of the brethren in the Lord, not only in the palace of Nero Caesar in this particular case here, but also other brothers in Christ, many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Man, and if Paul can do it, I can do it. Do you get the, the idea that's going on here? Uh, say, listen, here's this brother and he's gone through terrific turmoil. He's gone through a great deal of what we would call persecution even to the extent of prosecution and ultimately he's going to become a martyr for Jesus Christ his Lord and uh, many of the brothers they're, they're taking heart from my bonds uh, they're saying well if he can do it I can do it and they're living for Jesus Christ and preaching the gospel likewise waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Have you ever been around somebody who spoke the word without fear, maybe even after they'd undergone some trial and tribulation and it gave you courage? I've been in those kinds of situation and situations and I thank God for it. He says that's what's going on here. Now he goes on to say that some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ to contention not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds but the other of love knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, by the way, he's not talking about his going to heaven there. His going to heaven, that salvation was taken care of when he received Jesus as his Savior, right? When he talks about his salvation here, it's a different kind of salvation that he's talking about. He says, I, I know that this is going to turn to my salvation one way or the other. I know that I'm getting out of this cell here uh, one of these days one way or the other. I know I'm going to be out of here. I know one way or the other I'm going to be released to the arms of Jesus Christ. Now my real salvation is in and through the blood of Jesus who shed it on Calvary for my sin. But I, I want us to notice this. I, I think your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed but that with all boldness as always so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body whether it be by life or by death. Man, it seems to me like the Apostle Paul may realize, bear me witness. He may, he may have the thought going on in his mind right now. Say, I, I may not get out of here alive by man's standards. I think, folks, he's thinking, you know, this may be it. Worst may come to worst here. And I may wind up, now there is some discussion as to whether or not Paul actually was martyred that time or uh, 
whether this was the first time he was in prison and he was set free. Now he says, either way, I know it's going to turn to my salvation. I've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. I know I'm going to heaven. Uh, but I know it's your prayers for me. And, and I know it's the joy that I received by hearing your walking with the Lord that gives me courage to keep on keeping on for the Lord. Now don't undersell that statement. We who are Christians can often give our brothers and sisters strength in the Lord to keep on for the Lord by the way we act. Amen. Amen. You never want to undersell that thought. In fact, you want to give credibility to it because how you act and how you go about your Christian life can either be a discouragement or an encouragement to some brother or sister around you, right? That's the way it is, brothers and sisters. And he says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or whether it be by death. My desire is for Christ to be magnified in my body. And you folks out there living for Christ and serving the Lord, why, you're just an encouragement to my heart. Now, let's ask ourselves the question just for a minute. Am I an encouragement to my brothers and sisters in Christ to live for the Lord, or am I a discouragement? You know... Uh, the apostle said that he had no greater joy than to hear that his children were walking in the truth. Right. Do you remember that one? So what's the opposite? I have no greater heartache than to hear that my children are not walking in the truth. Right? And I got to tell you folks, uh, you want to be careful about the stuff you post on Facebook. You want to be careful about the verbiology you use on the social media. Because you never know when the pastor's wife is going to show it to the pastor. Now, I'm not on there and I'm not going to get on there. I don't want anything to do with it. I figure I'm accessible enough. If you want to get me, if you want me bad enough, you can call me on the phone. Leave a message. Keep calling back until you get me. You call enough times, I'll quit turning the ring. <laughs> but I want to tell you this, it's liable to be called to my attention. i got to tell you, it's a discouragement when I see church people, especially leaders in the church who are supposed to be walking with the Lord, and they're out there uh, acting like some kind of a worldling. Uh, maybe the ladies are not dressed modestly. Uh, maybe they've been to so-and-so place that they ought not to have been. Thank you, Brother Burke Holder, for bringing that to our attention. Amen. Listen, I'm telling you, folks, you're either an encouragement or a discouragement. If the apostle had no joy than to hear that his, his people that he had worked with and walked with and loved and preached to and, and uh, at, uh, perhaps had baptized and perhaps had seen him get saved under his ministry. He had the joy uh, the joy of Christ flooded his soul when he heard of things that meant they were walking with the Lord. Well the opposite of that is to hear of things when they're not walking with the Lord. Or to see things of that nature, right? Well, now, if that's true of the preacher, it's true of somebody else. Amen? You know what I'm trying to tell you? Your testimony does make a difference to somebody. You may not even know it till you get to heaven. And we're all going to have to give an account of everything done in the body when we get there, right? Isn't that what it says? 
Oh, what a joy it's going to be to see those people in heaven line up and say, Brother Burkholder, you were such an encouragement to me in this or in that, and, and I was watching you, and, uh, and uh, man, I tell you, I took heart. I, I, and boy, what a discouragement it's going to be, Brother Burkholder. I hate to tell you this, but... I'm not going to tell you all of it. I don't want to discourage you. <laughs> no, seriously, I'll settle that with the Lord one of these days. But I'm telling you, folks, it is something that we ought to consider. The Apostle Paul said, According to my earnest ex expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or whether it be by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. With that then, let's go back to Acts chapter number 28. And in this 28th chapter, the Apostle Paul said that he healed, uh, or the Bible says that he healed Publius' father. And then verse number 9, So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed. They also honored us with many honors, and when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. Now listen, folks, I want to uh, again repeat this. It doesn't seem to me like Paul made conditions of helping these people, does it? It seems like he was there. Hey, he'd, he'd help these people if he could. He'd do what he could for them to try to be a blessing to them. Now, i got to ask you a question. Do you think Paul went ahead and tried to witness to them of Jesus Christ? Amen. I do. In fact, as I've already told you, there is, uh, traditionally speaking, the thought that Paul was the one who brought Christianity to Sicily, where he was at this time, where St. Paul's Bay is, where the shipwreck took place. It is thought that he, it is traditionally stated anyway, that he is the one who brought Christianity uh, to that island. Uh, but I, I don't think that Paul was interested in keeping the statistics. Oh my goodness, we had X number saved today or this number that and so on and so forth. I don't think that was his plan. I think he wanted to try to go ahead and help who he could and let the statistics take care of themselves. And I think preachers are wise to do that in this day that we live in, in case you're interested, brothers and sisters. I think too many times we get interested in the stats and they can either lead to encouragement, which is the next step to pride. Or they can lead to discouragement, which is the next step to falling away. You guys may have heard of Radio Bible Class. M.R. Dehan, Day of Discovery, Radio Bible Class. They asked Dr. DeHaan one time, how many people are you having saved through your ministry? And he answered, uh, we do not know. We do not keep statistics. That's up to the Lord. I know of a large church up in Canton, Ohio. My dad knew the minister of this church. I've met him, but I really didn't know him. Uh, it's quite a large church. I, and when I say large, I mean they would have three and 4,000 in Sunday school. They had Sunday school and church, and then church Sunday night, church Wednesday night. It was a very large church. And uh, there for a while in our country, there got to be almost a circus rivalry between churches as to who had the biggest Sunday school or who had the most bad per year, or who had the this or who had the that. I, I think it got unholy myself. Uh, they began to ask this brother, why haven't you published how many you've had in Sunday school for a long time or how many you've had saved? And he said, we stopped giving out all that information. He said, there's got to be an unholy desire for statistics. And that has led to people thinking you're spiritual if the stats show it. 
or you're not spiritual if the stats don't show it. And folks, that is a lie of the devil. If that were true, Paul would have been a disaster. If that were true, Jeremiah would have been a disaster. So would a lot of those Old Testament prophets. So would a lot of those New Testament ministers that were around out there. What we need to do is just go ahead and work for the Lord and do as He leads us to do. And as I read this business of their having shipwreck on the island of Malta there at St. Paul's Bay, um, on the northern coast of Sicily there, it seems to me like the Apostle Paul was just going to go about his life the best he knew how. He was going to help whoever he could. Now you can be sure that when the Apostle Paul healed somebody, he didn't try to use that as a stepping stone to their getting saved. He, I don't think he said, say, I'll heal you if you'll... I don't think that was the case at all. But I think if I could just use Publius' father as an example there, uh, uh, Publius' dad's in there getting well. Maybe out in the living room there, Paul was talking to Publius, say, you know, Publius, um, I got to tell you, don't don't give me the praise for your dad getting better. Jesus healed him. And I want to tell you about Jesus because there's a bigger sickness than your dad had and that's the sin sickness. And Publius, we all have that because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Publius, I, I want to tell you about Jesus. You know, why I'm a prisoner here anyway, let me, let me tell you this whole thing, how this all, all started out. And Publius, you need Jesus as your Savior. Now, for whatever it's worth, it, it, by tradition, is that Publius got saved and became the bishop of the church in Sicily and later moved on over into Asia Minor and became one of the bishops of one of the seven churches there that are listed in Revelation. And I can't remember which one it was. I'm trying to think that he followed... Uh, Timothy or somebody at the churches at Ephesus, but I can't be sure on that. But whatever it's worth, I'm trying to get this idea across. Paul wasn't laying down conditions. He wasn't trying to have a contest to get people into church. He wasn't trying to give away healings in order to get his name in the newspapers or, or to garner a crowd. That wasn't the case at all. Paul's desire was to give out the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I can see him. There's uh, uh, Publius perhaps getting saved. And then uh, Publius saying, man, i got to tell Dad about this. Uh, Dad, uh, listen, uh, there's something worse than the, the disease you had. Uh, it's sin and it's heaven and hell that I'm talking about now, Dad. Dad, I want to see you in heaven when I get to heaven. And all these other people on the island of Sicily that were coming to get healed. I think the Apostle Paul was doing his best to try to... Uh, he was in medical missions, I guess if you want to call that. I don't know at that particular time. But I, I think he was doing his best... But I think he got down to the meat of the matter of the real problem, the real sickness, the worst sickness is soul sickness and sin. I think these, these people here, look at it again, read it with me here. So when this was done, verse 9 of 28 in Acts says, So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, that means they're getting ready to leave Sicily, they spent the winter there, and they laded us with such things as were necessary. Uh, some lady brought Paul uh, oatmeal raisin cookies. <laughs> And said, here, uh, here's you some treat on your way as you're headed up to Rome there. And somebody knitted Paul maybe a sweater or something like that. Here, uh, you, you'll need this. It uh, gets on cold on up in the hill country up there. It's not always like it is around Sicily here. Uh, you, you'll need this. And Dr. Luke says they laid it us. 
They all benefited from those things. And here they laded us with these honors and they gave us such things as uh, the Bible says were necessary uh, to their journey. And then after three months, after they wintered there at St. Paul's Bay, we departed in a ship of Alexandria. The other ship was from Alexandria too. Uh, in case you're interested, there seems to have been a big corn trade uh, between Alexandria and Rome, basically. But they all, uh, the ships all went into uh, Puteoli there on the Bay of Naples, which is now called called Naples, uh, Italy, in case you're interested. We'll get to it in just a moment. But uh, they harbored there for the winter, and then they went on. And the Bible says, After three months we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. So we've already talked about that. And landing at Syracuse. Uh, for whatever it's worth, Syracuse was uh, on their way toward the mainland of Italy and it was south of the Straits of Messina uh, there which is at the toe of the boot of Italy and be between the toe of the boot and the island of Sicily. And they came to Syracuse first, which was a thriving metropolitan city at that time, and I understand still is uh, at this day that we live in. We landed at Syracuse, and we tarried there three days, Luke says. And from thence, we fetched a compass, that's kind of an idiomatic phrase for whatever it's worth, uh, to show them how to sail across the straits over to Regium. Now, Regium was a city in a bay right on the toe of the mainland of Italy. In other words, they went across from Syracuse, across the sea, across the straits there, the narrow part between the toe and the island of Sicily. They went into Regium there. The Bible uh, says that after one day the south wind blew. Now, apparently they stayed at Regium waiting for that particular south wind that they wanted in order to have smooth sailing through the narrow straits that were between the tip, or rather the toe of the boot, and the uh, island of Sicily. And uh, Dr. Luke says, We waited one day and this soft south wind came. And so we left Regium there after one day and we came the next day to Puteoli. Now it is said that Puteoli is 182 miles north of Regium. And if the ship sailed, according to one man, at seven knots an hour, it would have taken them approximately 24 hours to get up to Puteoli from Regium. And you will notice that Luke says the next day we came to Puteoli. And uh, uh, then I want to say this, but then I'm going back to Puteoli for just a moment. Verse 14, where we found brethren. Oh, I submit for your consideration that that phrase is a happy phrase. With <laughs> the man, people speak the same lingo as we say. It doesn't matter whether you're Spanish or Italian or Greek or whatever. When you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's something about it. And so he says, Where well, we found the brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days. It doesn't say who desired for him to stay. And by this time, if you're interested, there are some who think it was Julius, the centurion, who wanted to stay there. Now keep in mind, this centurion had been with Paul all through that storm and everything, right? And you're going to see how that he courteously entreats Paul and tries to take care of Paul. It seems like this centurion and Paul became kind of good friends. 
That's another reason why I can't help but feel that this fellow came to Christ as his Savior. I hope he did anyway. He seems to display those kind of character marks. And so I think that he did. Now here we have them. We did, they would desired us to stay with them seven days. And then so we went toward Rome. And as they go to Rome, they're going to be taking the Appian Way which was an ancient Roman road that carried traffic throughout the peninsula there. I've seen some pictures of part of it even today that are still in good shape. Much of it, it lay in ruins, but some of it is still in good shape. They took the Appian Way. But let's go back to Puteoli for just a moment or two. They would have left... Regium and sailed up the west coast of Italy and pretty soon they would have reached the Bay of Naples. And yes, it's the same Bay of Naples that is the Bay of Naples today. And this area of Puteoli would have been on the north side of the bay. Interestingly enough, and I'm going to have to close with this this evening, our time is already up, uh, I'll close with this. Interestingly enough, they would have passed over to their right a tall mountain known as Mount what? I looked it up, so... Have you heard of Mount Vesuvius? Vesuvius. Vesuvius is on the Bay of Naples. Now, at that time of about 62 AD, it is thought, uh, when Paul was going by there and then going on to Rome, was there for two years and then the great fire of Rome was 67 AD. He was set free and then re-arrested after the fire of Rome by Nero Caesar. <clears throat> About 62 AD they would have passed Vesuvius. But at that time uh, Vesuvius uh, was not known as a uh, sleeping volcano. Vesuvius didn't erupt, have its major eruption, until 79 A.D. So as one man put it, little did Paul and his company know that as they passed Mount Vesuvius, just a few years later, the roof was going to blow off of it. And... Uh, depends on who you read, but an eyewitness and survivor of that volcanic explosion was Pliny the Younger. And the only eyewitness accounts we have of it, to my knowledge, is, is the record of Pliny. He wrote two letters to Tacitus the historian describing the situation. It is said that there were something like 16,000 people killed in that explosion. And statistically it is stated that the ash and uh, volcanic action spewed 20 miles into the air. 20 miles. Now when Paul passed by it, apparently it was a very placid scene, a very beautiful scene covered with greenery. It was uh, over the blue waters of the Bay of Naples there and the desirable part of the world. It, 
it was the leading western city that Paul had come into contact with. Uh, Puteoli as it was called at that time, but later now known as Naples. And yet just a few years later, uh, 16,000 people were going to be killed. It is the only volcano in Europe, to my knowledge, to have erupted in the last 100 years. And yes, Vesuvius has erupted in the last 100 years, but nothing like the 79 AD volcanic eruption that you've heard so much about. In fact, it has been stated that the force released by that volcanic action in 79 AD released thermal energy 100,000 times greater than the atomic bomb over Hiroshima or Hiroshima, however you want to say it. 100,000 times greater was that volcanic action. But here's the one that's going to get you. Josephus, who was the official Roman historian for the Jewish people, writes about the Apostle Paul and he writes about the eruption of Vesuvius. And Josephus says in his writings that Felix son who had been born to him by Drusilla now if you've been with me in Acts this should ring a bell to you I'm going to go back to it and read it in just a moment Josephus says that Felix son born to him by Drusilla who was a Jewess and his wife. I say Josephus says that both his son and Drusilla were killed in that volcanic eruption. Remember please that Felix had an audience with the Apostle Paul. And remember that Felix had been recalled back to Rome do you remember that? After he had left Paul in jail there. Now with that in the background, I'm asking you to turn to Acts chapter 24. And I want to read beginning in verse number 20. I'll start in verse 23 of Acts 24. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. And after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he, that is, as Paul reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way, for this time, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Now the point I want to make is this. I have not read where Josephus actually said Felix was killed in that same eruption. But I hope you'll think with me just a minute about this. About 20 years earlier, Felix had an audience with the Apostle Paul. And Drusilla was there. The son was born later. Now at least Drusilla and the son 
were killed in that volcanic eruption. But the point I want to make is Drusilla had heard the gospel. Felix had heard the gospel. Felix trembled. When we were there, you may recall my saying, I believe he trembled because he was under conviction. He told Paul, go thy way for this time. When I have a more convenient season, I'll call for you. We have no record of where Felix ever came to Christ. I hope that he did. And I'm thinking about Drusilla and the boy that were killed, according to Josephus. And it's like this to close. I'll put it this way. You know, Drusilla and the boy are either in heaven or hell today. Do you realize that? Now, Felix was a man of power. Even though he'd been recalled to Rome, probably for some ill favor because of one of the Caesars, even though he'd been called back to Rome, he was still a man of power, he was still a man of wealth, and he could probably give his boy that was born to him by Drusilla, who was a Jewess, I say he could probably give his boy many things. Drusilla, as the mother, could have been involved in giving the boy many things. But let me say this. If Drusilla never got saved and never told the boy about Jesus Christ and how to get saved, all that they could give that boy didn't amount to a hill of beans when it was all said and done. Parents, it does make a difference what kind of an education you give your kids. You better educate them in the way of Jesus Christ our Lord. Because when it's all said and done, there is a Vesuvius out there somewhere. There is a Vesuvius. And I often think to myself that that mountain blown its stack was kind of a picture form in a little way of hell, fire, and brimstone. Right? Volcanic action. I'll tell you what, when Drusilla and the boy were in that volcano's path, there's only one thing that mattered. And that's whether or not they knew Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now for whatever it's worth, Vesuvius is still considered an active volcano today. In fact, it is considered the most dangerous active volcano today because that area around the Bay of Naples, around Mount Vesuvius, is one of the most densely populated places on earth. There are some four million people around that mountain right now. They have said that if it blew its stack again like it did back yonder, there would be millions, not thousands killed. But folks, that's nothing compared to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Have you tried to get your relatives ready? Have you done what you could for the Lord? I trust that you will. And with that, I know I'm late, so I'm going to close the service this evening, but I want to make just a few moments of making prayer requests and then I'll pray to close this out in a word of prayer. Do you have a spoken prayer request you'd like to make known tonight? Please speak up.